Good morning, everybody. I'm doing a final sound check. Is everybody hearing me? Can I get a thumbs up? You can hear us. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody, to this session this morning. Um, it is, uh, we are having an audience that is coming in on site, and we are having an online audience as well. So welcome to all of you. Um, this session is particularly on multi-scale groundwater strategies in Africa, supporting innovation, and it's one of the opening um, sessions that we're having here at World Water Week, uh, which has the key topic of um, innovation and rethinking the way that we are looking at water. And I think as much as we should be having theoretical discussions about this, we are also having a bit of a practice session this morning as in how to be innovative in an unpredictable situation. So we can definitely expect people still moving in from the session as people are trying to find the venue. Uh, we are potentially also still trying to iron out some of the technical issues because this is one of the first sessions. Um, and we are also, at this point, uh, still waiting for one of, our, one of our speakers to arrive because he is making his way from the airport. So all in all, this is going to be an innovative session in how we're going to do this, but nonetheless, we are here. We're going to discuss groundwater governance and strategies in Africa um, across multiple scales. So my name is Claudia Schachtschneider. I am a program manager at a company called One World. Um, we are a consultancy that particularly focus on building social economic and institutional resilience in the context of climate and uh, ch climate change and resource constraints and uh, we're talking here particularly on groundwater today because we have um, we are from uh, based in Cape Town South Africa and for the last 15 years we've been primarily involved in looking at water sector governance issues in, in Africa at various ranges, looking at pan-African, regional, national, sub-national levels and river-based and organization levels as well. So that is one of the reasons why we are facilitating the sessions today, but very much in partnership with a lot of the stakeholders that are engaged in this area. So, um, yeah, so one of the things I want to go back on, this is a groundwater session, um, I want to go back to the theme of last year, which was valuing water and making the invisible visible. And uh, that goes back to the World Water Day theme that looked particularly at groundwater, making the invisible visible. And um, very much in the sessions last year, there was a focus on looking at groundwater from various perspectives, trying to really bring it to the fore and trying to make sure that it gains a similar amount of attention that surface water has in order to be able to look at the entire water sector um, and how we look at water more holistically. And there were very interesting comments uh, that I remember. Some were comments on over abstraction of groundwater in areas, uh, especially urban areas, for example, whereas other areas were completely um, had not actually looked at water resource tapping at all and found that to be a really good alternative conjunctive resource to use going forward. And there were also discussions on partnership development around it. And so ultimately last year was very much an agreement that we need to look at groundwater innovatively. And I think this year is really the question of how we're gonna do that. So it's the how question that we are really here for. And um, so that is really what we would like to focus our discussion on today. And uh, particularly in the strategy development area, in the groundwater governance area, um, because it is really essential if we've got, um, got to shift the thinking of how we look at groundwater, that strategies are a very important first place to start. And it is a deeply complex situation. It's a deeply complex endeavor to do. And um, when we look at the African perspective, there is initiatives around groundwater strategy development all around um, at multiple scales. And I think that is really what we would like to, uh, to bring to the fore and to showcase as well, that there is a lot happening in the space with a lot of very involved stakeholders and institutions, and that the complexity 
of pulling this together is really one that has quite a lot of similarities across some of the scales that we look at and maybe also some differences. And that is what we would like to explore in the session. Um, and the way that we are going to do this is we're going to invite our various speakers to the fore um, and we're going to have each panelist um, talking towards a particular scale. So the first um, panelist we're going to invite is going to look at uh, at this groundwater strategy question from a SADC perspective, a regional perspective. Our second panelist is going to look at it from a river basin organization perspective because river basin organizations obviously delineate surface waters, but nevertheless, they still have uh, transboundary aquifers underneath them um, that, that also fall within the geography, so they're important to incorporate. Uh, we are also having one speaker online that is going to join us and he is particularly um, going to speak at what this means at a national scale, but because he is uh, a wonderfully regional individual, he's able to look at it from various country perspectives across Africa. And then finally, we are also going to hold this all the back out to a global perspective, looking at groundwater strategy, um, governance and innovation um, at the global level as well. So we're going to zoom in and out, um, out of various scales as we discuss this. Um, and I would at this point in time like to ask, um, this is where we get where we get flexible because the first speaker is actually uh, Pera Ramueli, and he is the um, the executive um, secretary for um, Ocacom, and he used to be the director for water for the water division and SADC for many many years, but he is still making his way here, and um, in well not that not that we can exactly have a representative of the institution, but at least we can have uh, a representative perspectives from that particular scale. And Belinda Petrie from One World is kindly going to step in and going to give an introduction for that for yeah, the next five minutes about, um, giving us an idea of um, the kind of institutions that are operating at SADC scale and how that relates to this overall discussion topic for today. Thank you. Thanks. Does this just work? Apparently. Yeah. All right. Um, morning, everyone. I, I look like Pere Ramueli, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so as Claudia said earlier, um, Pere, who is on his way, so he'll be able to participate properly on the panel later, was going to give an overview of what um, is happening in the SADC region. Um, I've had the fortune, fortunate position of working with Pere well, probably for the last, I don't know, 14 or 15 years, So and with SADC GMI. So I've got a reasonable amount of perspective um, on what they do, and I hope I represent it accurately. Um, but I think it starts with something Claudia mentioned a little while ago, and that is that one of the groundwater SADC multi-stakeholder um, dialogue events, which were wonderful events that used to be held on an annual basis in the region, uh, the beginning of the last decade, so either 29 or 2010, Mike and I were de deliberating the exact date earlier, it doesn't matter, but around 12, 13 years ago, um, the SADC Water Division at the Southern African Development Community um, hosted a multi-stakeholder dialogue on groundwater. And One World, and in those days, Mike was with Groundwater Partnership, although he says he wasn't at that dialogue event itself, I don't believe him, um, but One World and Groundwater Partnership um, helped SADC to pull that um, event together. Um, and it was amazing because it was so starkly clear at the time how much and how little people in the region knew about groundwater. And Jenny, who's a groundwater or has been a groundwater governance expert, um, you would be interested to know that we hadn't even thought about groundwater governance in those days. Um, I'm very happy to say that a subsequent decision was taken by SADC um, to establish the SADC Groundwater Management Institute. 
um, which is an institution that um, it's a subdivision of SADC Water, and it's the institution that is co-hosting this event today. Um, it's an innovation in and of itself, given this year's um, theme, um, because there aren't that many um, regional institutions for groundwater in, in Africa. Um, we've just been working with MCAR, the African Ministerial Council for Water, on their groundwater strategic program. And so the research on that showed us um, that at a regional level, these institutions don't exist, but they're so necessary. Um, so from a groundwater governance support, accelerating groundwater development, the advent of SADC GMI has been a fantastic um, uh, initiative. Um, it's been going for some time. They've been excellent at um, mobilizing resources, which One World has been implementing and spending some of that money for them in the region on um, projects such as capacitating regional stakeholders on groundwater finance, so how to finance a groundwater project, which is complex, um, and we ran that course, we developed design and ran that course online for SADC GMI over a period of 18 months, um, and there's a very robust um, even if I say so myself, training manual online um, that's accessible to stakeholders and that training course gets replicated. So that's been an incredible initiative to build the capacity for financing groundwater. Another key initiative has been to establish, um, and this static GMI facilitates, we've also implemented some of this for them, establishing institutional and um, governance arrangements in the different SADC member states. And it's also a very innovative platform so they call it a national focal group, um, and it's a multi-stakeholder platform that is formalized to under a secretariat and a host institution to um, pave the way for increasing or accelerating groundwater investments in a given country. So SADC has got 15 member states, um, and at the moment we are busy with the three with three. Um, countries and previously we did five countries so by the beginning of 2024 eight countries um, so that's more than half of the SADC member states will have um, these institutional arrangements um, and then in addition to a grant program that SADC GMI has instituted with the finances it's been able to mobilize. They also developed a, um, a manual um, on policy, legal, and institutional frameworks in SADC. It's very comprehensive and provides an excellent guideline um, for countries that are and national focal groups that are trying to design and implement groundwater projects. And then the most recent initiative, which we're hoping other regional um, Transboundary Basin organizations, so RBOs will take up, is the development of a groundwater strategy at the Limcom, in the Limcom Basin. So that's the Limpopo River Basin Commission um, that asked for this. Uh, it's a basin that is termed closed in that there's no water left to allocate. So the dependence on groundwater is accelerating in the Limpopo Basin. By the time that river reaches Mozambique downstream, there is no water. Um, to, to reach them. So the, the dependence on, on aquifer systems is, is accelerating, and particularly the focus on realizing socioeconomic benefits, which is an overarching strategy for the SADC region. So that's just to, to tie that up. Claudia, I think that's probably enough of a scene setting, um, but I think I can happily, um, on behalf of SADC GMI, who we've spoken to in developing this event, um, and to our partner, just welcome you um, and look forward to your comments and questions. Shall I stay here until Peredith? Thank you, Belinda. Yes, I would appreciate if you if you fill 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 the fill space. the shoes on yeah. the shoes. Yes, um, I I do have to say we do have a bit of a technical issue. I cannot move the slides on the side, so um, I would just love to be able to move to the next slide. May I ask for your assistance, please? Thank you. Um, in the next, the next speaker is going to be um, representing a river basin organization perspective. So we would like to call to the fore Michael, Michael Romano. He is working for Orasicom, which is the, um, the river basin organization for the Orange Senku River Basin right in the south um, of Africa in SADC. Michael, welcome. Thank you very much. Great to have you here. Please, would you give an introduction 
as to who you are and who you represent, and then also uh, your perspective on how, how river basin organizations fit into this discussion. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, good morning, everybody, and um, great to be here. Uh, as already introduced, my name is Michael Romano. I work for the Orange Sinku River Basin Commission, uh, which is based, the Secretariat is based in South Africa in Centurion. Um, and primarily we are working uh, with the four member states uh, within the basin. This is Lesotho, South Africa, Botswana, and Namibia. Those are the four, uh, four countries that constitute Orasakom. And we are working, I think, uh, over time, we started working on surface water, which is the water that we can see. But we have also then realized that there is a lot of groundwater that we have within the basin. Um, and a lot more focus is moving towards uh, 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 the groundwater resources within the basin. If you look at uh, the the map that's shown there. You will have all the four countries, like I indicated, it's Lesotho, um, which is primarily our water source. It provides most of the water that goes into the basin. The same water goes down into the Houten province, uh, which is the economic hub of the region. Then it goes down into the Western Cape, uh, which is, I would say, an agricultural hub. Um, a lot of the wines that make us happy come from that area. And then it goes down all the way uh, to where it is the demarcates the border between Namibia and South Africa, and then ends at, that, um, at the river mouth. Now, Lesotho gets a lot of rainfall. So surface water is very important, which is then transferred around the basin. The Gauteng area also is a, a reasonable amount, but due to the populations, you realize that um, that water is not even enough. But going down to the west, uh, towards Botswana, uh, most of South Africa, and Namibia, very limited uh, surface water resources, so we rely a lot on groundwater uh, resources within the basin. They drive most of our uh, economic activities and livelihoods, as well as uh, environmental um, functions. However, while, this, while we rely so much on groundwater within the basin, we know very little. I think it's more of out of sight, out of mind. It's only when times are tough, when droughts hit, that we then remember that we've got our groundwater. By the time you get there, pollution has occurred and so forth. So the challenges that come around our groundwater are massive within uh, the, this basin. And then to make matters worse, we then have transboundary aquifers that are shared between uh, the, the member states. Um, if you look at the map, we have starting here uh, the Karoo sedimentary aquifer, which is shared between Lesotho and uh, South Africa. And it's in an area where it supports um, a, a huge population. Then coming down, you will have uh, the Kakia Bray uh, Dolomite um, aquifer, which is between Botswana and South Africa. And um, also uh, supporting uh, big, I would say, villages such as Tsabong uh, in Botswana and uh, across uh, the, the farmers on the South African side. We then have the Stamprit Aquifer, which is shared between Namibia, Botswana, and South Africa. And this basin supports a lot of mining and agricultural activities within that. So the challenges are also massive. And then lastly, we have uh, the coastal sedimentary aquifer at the very end there around the river mouth, which is between South Africa and, uh, and Namibia. The challenges within all this are, dif are different, but I think the key ones are that 
we having no governance structures in place to be able to manage them better. And then because of that loophole, you end up um, with challenges that keep on increasing almost on a daily basis. So this, uh, for us as Orasacom, as is something that needs to be addressed. We are working towards uh, uh, setting up institutions within the various uh, aquifers so that we can manage better. Uh, thank you, Claudia. I hope I, it's within the five minutes. You were perfect. You were so spot on. Thank you so much, Michael. <laughs> and, and thank you very much for painting the picture as well from, from this uh, river basin organization level and the complexities that sometimes it might be the river basin uh, um, organization that might have to look at these issues, but then sometimes it might also make sense to look at bilateral agreements, for example, because it happens to only be between two countries and not all three of them. So, so there is that type of complexity to look at. Um, the next, I would like to move across to online and introduce to you um, Dr. Saifu Kabede. He is uh, a lecturer at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. Um, and um, he is going to talk to us about the national perspective. His choice of country to, to show at least was the, the Ethiopian um, country um, a groundwater map. Um, but him being also sitting in South Africa, he can talk about this national perspective. Um, I think as far as I understand from a, from a more North African, a South, a Southern African, as well as a Western African perspective. So, Sefu, welcome. It's great to have you here. Um, and we would like to hear from you for the next five minutes. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks so much. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, I'll use the next uh, five minutes to uh, introduce uh, my center, the center where I'm working, and uh, uh, highlight also some of the experiences uh, uh, from uh, other uh, regions of Africa. Yes, I'm from the Center for Water Resources Research uh, in the University of KwaZulu-Natal. And this center has been established in uh, 2012 uh, by coming together of academics uh, working or researching uh, water, uh, particularly um, or with focus on, on surface waters in, in this part of the world. And the center is known for uh, the developing uh, hydrology tool or model called ACRU. And uh, then uh, the center has expanded uh, its research in many other areas, like in uh, tree water use, uh, AET instrumentation for evapotranspiration estimation and, and measurement, and precision agriculture. Uh, the center is also known for research in water, energy, and food nexus uh, uh, approaches. And uh, yeah, the other institution I also I'm affiliated with uh, is the International uh, Association of Hydrogeologists. Uh, the International Hyd Association of Hydrogeologists is, is a, a 4,000 member uh, association, a non-profit uh, organization uh, whose uh, chairperson, uh, president is Professor David uh, Kramer, uh, based in the University of Nevada and um, serving as vice president for uh, Africa, or Sub-Saharan Africa region. Yes, so my uh, experience on a personal basis and as uh, affiliation was uh, affiliated with uh, UKZN, University of KwaZulu-Natal, and formerly with Addis Ababa University is on uh, trying to support the knowledge generation for uh, for groundwater to be used uh, sustainably for social economic transformation in, in the sub-Saharan Africa region. So as a result uh, of some experience in the Nile, Niger uh, basins and working also with the IGAD um, region, uh, the SADC region, as well as the ECOWAS in, in Western Africa. Of particular interest for me here uh, is the scale. I think that is a key, uh, the key issue. Uh, working at different scales, you know, it, it is of interest because 
I assume or understand this is a universal problem, uh, universal problem in water management, uh, in hydrological sciences, in soil sciences, in meteorological sciences. What works in one scale may not be appropriate in the other scale. So uh, in a usual hydrology teaching, we start with scale issues in hydrology. And I think some knowledge can be, you know, cross filterized uh, from one discipline to another. And then I'm particularly interested to talk about that, but uh, we we'll focus on national scale and what it means for uh, regional scale. Uh, so the map shown here is, uh, uh, yeah, a hydrogeology groundwater information map uh, meant to be used to drive drilling, successful drilling at, at local level. So at local level, what matters a lot is the borehole. So you have groundwater, uh, ecosystems may be dependent on groundwater, but people use groundwater using boreholes. So the, there are a lot of complex issues around boreholes from functionality, management, you know, sustainability, etc. And I'll be happy to talk about that in uh, the next minutes. Thank you. Ba back to you. Thank you so much. Um... Seifu, um, we are going to come back to you in a little while. Um, I would uh, take a moment, please, to call on the, the last of our panelists onto uh, to one of our tables here. Um, she's pretty well known in the Siwi circles, uh, Jenny Grunwald, and uh, she is currently working for CEDA um, as a program specialist. And we would like to hear from her from Jenny about the global perspective. If you are starting to look at transboundary aquifers, groundwater governance, mm -hmm. what does that mean? Um, if you zoom out and you look at what's happening globally and what the trends currently are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claudia. Uh, very happy to be here and great to see so many friends in the audience. And I hope there's very many online as well watching this uh, on this beautiful Sunday morning. Um, so. When you take a global or international perspective, uh, when you zoom out, I would first say that a lot of what previous speakers have been saying does apply also to that scale. Uh, also, as, as Seifer said, very much what works at one scale does not apply to another scale. So that gives us a certain um, perspective or a bit of a challenge if we look at the groundwater uh, from that uh, perspective. And indeed, because um, groundwater is very local and that distinguishes groundwater resources, uh, groundwater as a source, groundwater management and governance very much from surface water and um, other ways of obtaining water and managing water and governing water. So my own uh, experience um, with groundwater, started as a PhD student. Um, I was doing my field work in India, in um, the uh, mega city of Bangalore, uh, which is also an IT hub. Um, back then, uh, it was growing tremendously. I assume it is still growing tremendously. But one thing that I realized um, very quickly was that in the slum areas, in the peri-urban informal areas and so on, um, whether you are poor or rich, you depend on groundwater and you access groundwater, you ensure that you get hold of groundwater because that is what is accessible when uh, everything else fails. Um, so this type of, of self-supply, um, also we can, we can link that up from the very, very local, like almost individual household level to what Eleanor Ostrom um, said in terms of governance that what works for groundwater governance is uh, collective action and self-governance. She was, of course, then talking mostly about irrigation, farmer collectives and um, joint actions, um, collaboration between uh, communities. And yes, we're talking about innovation this year at the World Water Week. Um, I think we are still not so far from Eleanor Ostrom's insights that what we need is collective action. And when we look at and talk about governance, um, maybe that is still the solution, which we will talk more about later, of course. Um, 
When we talk about the global, international scale and groundwater, we also, of course, talk a lot about uh, institutions and uh, governing bodies, organizations, various different UN bodies, and such as EGRAC, which has produced this um, updated map from 2021 showing the transboundary aquifers of the world. Um, and this is work in progress. EGRAC, uh, the International Groundwater Resource Assessment Center, is part of the UN family. Um, it works tirelessly together with researchers, practitioners, um, and others to try and map and understand the transboundary uh, aquifers of the world. Um, and just as one little detail, if we look at the SADC region, uh, there are 24 transboundary aquifers uh, for those 12 countries. Um, but we also know that if we say that, okay, so we have 24 transboundary aquifers there. All in all, I think the EGRAC map now shows some 468 transboundary aquifers. Um, some of those are not very well known. Um, and again, so if you look at the global map, you need to go down to the very local. Um, you need to move between the, for instance, the, the NASA gray satellite imagery that can cover vast expanses of, uh, <clears throat> of Earth and in total help us to understand um, groundwater availability um, and overdraft and so on. But then you need to go down to the very local scale again and do the ground truth thing to really understand what is happening there. Um, I think I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very nice, very nice. Uh, you did a rapid zoom in and out mm. <laughs> all at the same time. Um, I would like to um, make the announcement that we are still missing our official SADC representative. So we are keeping Belinda here in the space and I'm going to be asking um, her um, the, some of the questions first. So we are now going to go into the panel discussion phase where um, I've got three particular <laughs> questions I would like to ask each panelist and they then have about two, two and a half minutes to answer each of those. Um, and then, um, well, hopefully that's going to work out to such a way that we get through all three questions. And then after that, it's over to you as the audience. So, um, yeah, given that strategy development is really essential, and it's deeply complex, as we've heard, um, but it's a really necessary step in our groundwater governance. And I think it was very clearly explained that, that we are nowhere near actually being able to govern groundwater the way that it deserves at the moment. We are literally driving a car without a fuel gauge. So, and that is not a particularly safe way of uh, traveling into this form of resource use. So um, over to you, Belinda. I think it would be nice to understand from the SADC perspective, and I am now going to bring up the SADC slide again because that wasn't working just now. There we are. Here is the <laughs> overview of SADC and its transboundary aquifers. Um, Belinda, from that perspective, what do you think are the key priorities that um, in the kind of groundwater strategy development process that should be focused on? Thanks, Claudia. Um, and again, I'm speaking from the perspective of supporting, um, you know, One World supporting various institutions, including SADC GMI on strategy development. And I think the thing that struck all of us um, is how difficult it is to harness a common vision for groundwater development among stakeholders that until, I don't know, let's use 2010 as the sort of threshold year when SADC had the multi-stakeholder water dialogue on groundwater. Um, you know, I'm struck that since then, many stakeholders, including the policy decision makers, so the ones that have to agree on a strategy and, and drive that strategy, and Mike, you'll understand this from a transboundary river basin level where you've got multiple member states, um, how little they know about the benefits of groundwater, socioeconomic benefits, um, which can be immense. Um, we don't even know if they are immense, actually, if I may say it as crudely as that. I mean, we know the potential. We know that if we don't use groundwater um, conjunctively and integrate it with surface water in regions like Southern Africa, which is mainly arid and semi-arid, we're nowhere. 
I mean, we're a water scarce region. So we know that. Um, and we know that groundwater can add value, but we don't know exactly what the socioeconomic benefits are. We know what they could be. We know they could be for urban water use, drinking water, water and sanitation and hygiene, um, agriculture, so food security. Um, so, you know, there are benefits across the sort of spectrum of well-being. But to harness a common vision is absolutely essential. Um, and I think that needs to be, and I'd be interested in, in Mike's comment on this as well. He's a long regional um, standing expert is, you know, what, what, what would that vision look like? Um, all the obvious words come to mind, like sustainable, equitable utilization um, but these are you know these are international terms that the region has subscribed to but how do you translate those into the reality of of the region so that's the the first thing claudia i think the second thing is that um in that vision and in the rollout of a strategy there has to be elements like awareness raising at all levels so I've spoken about this. So the political level, the policy decision-making level, the financing level, the user level, which includes communities, but also industries. Mike spoke about mining quite a bit earlier, for example. Um, and so you've got big vested interests at play in the basin. So that, you know, that, that capacity building awareness, common vision that needs to happen. Um, Mike and Jenny have said, and I've said, we don't know enough about the resource. Um, so the invisible actually is still invisible um, because we really don't know enough about it. And um, one of the comments that came out from a stakeholder in, in the African Pan-African Groundwater Strategic Program development was actually quite telling, and that was that the tools and the guidelines for um, evaluating and assessing groundwater, so groundwater assessments, everyone knows it's needed because we need to know, you know, what is the abstraction, what is the use, what is the sustainability, what is the recharge, what does climate change do to that? We need to know that. But the comment the stakeholder made went, went way beyond we need to know that. His comment was, we're not using best practice tools and methods for doing these assessments, and we don't even know what those best practice methods are. Um, and, you know, that kind of gave me a jolt because I thought, you know, here you've got a decision maker that potentially is going to go out and do a groundwater assessment like we're doing in Zambia. Um, but he could be using a, a methodology that's not useful. Um, so a groundwater strategy has to go and understand exactly what the needs are and what the strategic objectives are. Those are easier to ascertain. But what do you need to do to get there? which assessments, what capacity building, what awareness raising, and against what common vision. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm. Um, Michael, over to you. <laughs> Do you still have the question in mind, or would you like me to repeat it? Uh, I think you can repeat it. Okay. So the question was, what, from your perspective, um, looking at river basin organizations, what would be the key priorities that uh, should be focused on when looking at groundwater strategy development. Okay. I think um, for me, really, one of the key challenges that we having at river basin level is always around when you look at an aquifer, say Stamprit as an example, which is between Namibia, Botswana, and South Africa. And you realize that there are growing pressures within uh, that aquifer system. Which laws apply? Do you apply Namibian laws? Do you apply Botswana laws? Or you would say because the activity is happening in Namibia, we'll apply Namibian laws, but you don't take into consideration the impact that it will have on Botswana, the impact that it will have on South Africa. And I think that's one of the key that um, we are looking at the various laws that are the laws and legislation that is there to govern this uh, aquifers. But when it comes to practice, it's often one country. So if an activity is happening in Namibia, that's where it will end. And this does not take into um, uh, consideration the fact that this shared aquifers as they are, um, really 
affect all the three countries, affect all the livelihoods around there, and then um, we should be able to look at the bigger impact. I think more like what we do when we do environmental assessments, so that you look on the impact on the other countries um, as well. And I think Belinda rightly pointed out we don't have a common vision. Without that, then we have a lot of problems uh, that we, 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 we can't really um, address, even at any point. Uh, so you will realize that without these, then you are putting more pressure on, on the resource that is there. The other thing for me that I think over time we are picking up is that we have, we are losing almost the resource due to um, various pressures. Mainly one of the key ones within our basin is pollution. A lot of our resources are being lost either from pollution from the industries, agriculture, mining, and so forth. And then how does our common vision address this? So for me, that the lack of that common vision is really uh, key there. You know, at times, I think we might have had recently, we had a problem in South Africa that uh, was related to uh, the Hamans Kral issue around um, uh, cholera. 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 I was looking for that, around cholera. And one thing, you know, we are looking at surface water sources as a cause or as a source of that pollution. And nobody ever even says, but what's the state of our groundwater resources? What's the state of our groundwater resources? Can they contribute to this? And I've, Belinda always uh, kicks me when I say this. We treat groundwater like a child from that other family. They are not ours. <laughs> always. Um, I think another one, we are talking of, oh, okay. We are talking of innovation. How do we take it forward? And we are seeing a lot of technologies are coming up within the basin. Um, an example is we are currently seeing a, almost a mushroom of desalination plants within the basin, trialing new things to make more water available to the communities. Like always, we look at the end product, we forget about the reject water which then pollutes our limited groundwater resources. So you if you look at most uh, diesel, diesel plants within the basin, you start off with four boreholes that are supplying that. Within two years, you are remaining with two because the reject water has polluted the other two boreholes and the TDS is now beyond what the diesel plant can deal with. So even these newer technologies, in addition to the ones that we don't know how to deal with under groundwater assessments, these are even creating a bigger problem. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are going to have to tighten it up a little bit more, I think, when we speak. Um, Sefu, uh, please, can we go over to you? Would you be able to give us some input here on the same question? What do you think are the key priorities that should be focused on when we look at strategy development from a national perspective? Yeah. Yes, from the national perspective, uh, that is where you see extreme complexity. You know, the nature of the problems you have vary from place to place. So local means complex. So, and then in this complex situation, the, the needs are different, the, you know, the problems are different. And then how can you arrive at something that works across, you know, these different local scales? But there is one thing uh, unique about uh, ground that I would like to highlight. If you harm the ground water resource locally, or let, let me put it uh, otherwise, the harm, you will not harm 
the regional groundwater without harming your own resource in that local environment. So the first people or communities that will feel the harm are not those far away from the site where the groundwater is mismanaged. So it is to the interest of the local actors to govern groundwater wisely or to use groundwater wisely. So the harm, the regional harm comes first after the local harms have been felt. So that is point number one. And then under this situation, what based options do we have to you know, develop groundwater strategies locally? I, I think considering the diversity of the issues, one approach that works across the scale is all scale is difficult to, to implement. Then I would say problems and solutions that fit local needs, solutions that fit local situations. And then who is do, uh, able to, to, to do this? I think that local leadership will have the highest facilitation role, identifying the problems and then proposing with, you know, with the stakeholder engagement, coming up with local solutions. So the sum of these local solutions together organically create a shared vision for a, a given, uh, the, for, the, for the regional scale. There are a number of tools already out there, like water stewardship. There is country support tool that has been developed, for instance, by the, um, the BGR. Uh, there are frameworks for managed groundwater development uh, through participatory identification of problems and key actions locally or at different scales. So I think the missing link for me is the leadership. The leadership who is enabled to take these different strategies and apply them as it fits the problems that we have at hand. So th thank you so much and back to you. Thank you, Sufu. And um, you actually very nicely already um, uh, talked talked to, to one of the next questions I was going to ask. Um, Jenny, can you, from your perspective, give a quick um, one or two bullet points? Absolutely, and we're, uh, we're still on the, the strategies that should be focused on, um, which is uh, in a way easy to answer from the, the global perspective because th uh, the global perspective is very normative. Um, we are, whether we are talking about groundwater in a domestic setting or in a transboundary setting, um, we, I mentioned institutions before. We also have, of course, a lot of policy and law, which, uh, for instance, products uh, like this and the process behind it. So last year's World Water Development Report um, with a sole focus on groundwater. So um, those of us who were uh, involved in authoring this uh, were instructed to, uh, to write chapters on governance, on management, on policy and strategy, etc. So this is what can come out from the global level. Uh, sort of advice, recommendations, uh, attention being pointed to. These are some good examples that other transparency aquifer um, have um, applied, for instance. Um, and, and yeah, the should is very much there. Uh, there can be uh, attention provided to uh, a certain um, way of planning for groundwater, for instance. And that is what can be provided from the global international scale, you could say. Um, but of course, I need to mention the big challenge, which is that, <clears throat> again, um, I mean, if you if you would talk about domestic groundwater, there's the sovereignty, uh, the mandates, uh, the jurisdiction, which very often then, as Mike was um, alluding to, hinders the collaboration in transboundary settings, because uh, even where it is established without doubt that several countries share one aquifer, uh, share research areas, share benefits and, and uh, polluting the source. Um, to overcome the sovereignty issues is a big matter. And uh, yeah, 
Don't stare. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, to another question which some of you have already spoken to, and if you already have, I think maybe maybe um, we're going to leave it at that for the interest of also getting to the third question. But Belinda, from your point of view, what is missing? In what? What is missing that <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to the strategy development that um, in, in that kind of whole process, what are the key gaps that I think we, we somehow need to still grapple with and, and um, mm. find innovative solutions to? Um, I think it's um, Sefu's point, actually, and, and Mike, you've also made it in some respects. The, um, the resource is local. Um, and, you know, I thought Sefu's point on the contamination starts mm -hmm. at home. Mm -hmm. So you better look after your own resource and before it even gets to the Arasacom level. Um, people maybe don't know that, I think is the first thing. Um, they don't know what the actions are doing um, and they don't know how important the resource to them mm -hmm. is to them. So I would start there. Um, and which is not how we normally do things. <laughs> if I may speak bluntly in the region, we normally start at the sort of policy level and then go down to consult. And by the time we go consult, it's like, can you tick this box? Are you happy with the strategy or policy? Mm -hmm. um, I'm saying this as a consultant, not a static GMI. Um, please be aware of that. <laughs> um, I'm allowed to say these things. The um, what we often don't do enough of is starting that policy and strategy development at the grassroots level um, and then building it up outwards. Mm -hmm. um, so that, Claudia, I think for me would be the innovation. I mean, we talk about it a lot, but we don't do it. Mm -hmm. So doing it would be the innovation. Um, how to do it requires innovation further because it's impossible. And this is why it doesn't happen, to go and talk to the millions of people that populate um, a, a given river basin or a country. I mean, South Africa has got a population somewhere around 60 million, probably more. Um, it's a lot of people to go consult in some very differentiated circumstances. So how do you get that representation? I'm hoping that some of this week's discussions on digital digitalization, um, it's early in the morning to be saying that, but I'm hoping that, you know, some innovative solutions are being thought about to go and engage at that, at that grassroots level and to do this properly. Thanks. Thank you, Belinda. Michael, any particular thing jumping out that you would like to share? I think for me, the, the one that comes up would be what governance structures are we using for um, shared aquifers as they are? You know, we are in a situation where we've got limited resources, so we can't set up new, newer structures as so far. We At Orasocom, we are trying to set up multi-country cooperation mechanisms, especially for the stats, and see how that will work. But as the discussion goes, it now translates to you need the physical bodies to be able to uh, set up the structure, coordinate it, and be able to um, manage it better. Do we have the resources to? Mm -hmm. Chances are that is not even a sustainable way of even doing it, because looking at how um, difficult it is uh, to get the resources, would this really work for us? So for me, that's one that stands up quite well. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you. That is great. Um, and we are going over to Sifu first before Jenny. <laughs> so we're going online to, to Sifu to see if he oh, has we got... Are dealing with... There you are. Can you hear me? Yes, we can yes. hear you. Thank you, Sifu. Yes. So w when you are dealing with two different scales and then processes happening as these two different scales, the other key thing that we that needs to be recognized is that one scale should not override or suppress the other one. Mm. And that there are emergent share, you know, what they share together. In, in natural systems, yeah, you have, you know, hill slope scale hydrology, and then that everything that in hill space 
space hydrology will not fit into the basin. Nevertheless, it will not also annul what is uh, you know, happening at the, at the basin scale. So what we should be careful about in this management system, uh, my understanding, is that one should not override the other. For instance, if we look what is on the table of the water leader, particularly the mid-level leader in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, maybe Sadek region out, but the other part of Sub-Saharan Africa, there are a number of initiatives, a number of priorities on the table coming from multiple directions, local, regional, international, UN. Ah. And then I would fear there is a kind of priority overload. And then most of you know groundwater development cannot easily happen without partnership, international partnership, which is perfect, which is good. Nevertheless, what we put on the table of the mid-level leader may be too much, and this at least to priority overload. And then we need to be particularly in countries or regions whereby resources are constrained, human resources are constrained and uh, understaffed. Uh, you know, moving, you know, these different initiatives coming from multiple directions can be a, a priority overload and an adaptation to, a good adaptation to priority, you know, multiple priorities could be fine, but a maladaptation to it can lead to, uh, to other challenges, you know, uh, maybe giving less priority to where you need to put your, your time in. So coordination, sector coordination, you know, different users among stakeholders, among partners. I think uh, coordination among partners, like in the watch sector, I think there are success stories in the watch sector whereby different actors come together even to the level of producing one report and one uh, plan and one finance, you know, some, in some countries in sub-Saharan Africa region. And then that kind of coordination by, you know, facilitated by the ministries, by the sector uh, leaders would be, you know, would, uh, yeah, uh, I, I don't know how to put it. <laughs> so, yeah, just uh, thinking. Yeah, thank you. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ginny, can you give us a, a closing point as well? Very brief. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, so one thing that is missing at the international level now is one uh, binding water convention that covers also groundwater um, in, in an integrated way and in, in, in a comprehensive way, because the conventions that we have, they, uh, they don't apply, they, there are certain limitations to those. Um, so the International Law Commission has been driving this process for a long time, um, whereby uh, draft articles of a convention on transboundary aquifers um, have been suggested. And they have been raised with the UN General Assembly several times, the last uh, time that was last year, it's being tabled all the time. Um, so the, these draft articles that are mentioned in um, General Assembly resolutions and the next time that the General Assembly will treat this subject, the suggestion is in 2026. So we're not really inching closer, but s some people do believe that with a binding convention on transboundary aquifers, we would uh, take that extra step. Thank you. Um, in the interest of time, because we are now um, starting to bite into, into the question and answer time, and I find it's really important that we actually hear from you as well. So I'm going to pause the last question, which is around key action and enabling factors, and I'm going to ask you to use that as your final conclusions comment. Yes? Okay, thank you. So um, I think this is the point where I'm handing this over to the online as well as the on-site audience. Um, if you have any particular questions to any of our panelists, please, you are welcome. Um, we would welcome some questions. Um, and I just want to make sure that Hillary, um, we have got some backup staff that is that is also co-hosting this with us online. So we've got Hillary and Stacy back in Cape Town um, monitoring this process for us. Hillary, are you online? Can you hear us? And is there anything in the chat? Hi, Claudia, can you hear me? Yes. 
we can. Great. Um, unfortunately, no questions in the chat yet, but I'll let you know if anyone does. I'm sure they're busy formulating okay, at the moment. Perfect. Do, do pipe up when you're here. I see one question is over here. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I need to ask tech, um, how do people speak? Mm. Just, talk. Just talk? Is it going to be captured? Or do we need a microphone? microphone. Okay, I see somebody coming down the stairs. <laughs> To the third lady in the second row, please. The third lady, second row, was up first. Thank you. And there's one here. Yeah, thank you. I see you. Thank you so much for those interesting uh, questions. My question was, you know, we're sitting in 2023, and sometimes it feels like even with everything that we've done, we're still struggling. We're, we're kind of, it feels like two steps forward, one step back. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to for, for, you know, follow up on what Belinda said about digitalization, and I was wondering, we, there, there's a little bit of, of a chicken and egg problem with you can't govern unless you have data, mm. but then you don't, exactly. you don't collect data unless you have a governance structure to yeah. feed it into. And I was wondering whether, you, uh, whether people wanted to comment on really interesting innovations that have happened around the data side, new ways of mapping, new ways of collecting and sharing data that they think have helped break that gridlock um, and at least create transparency around what's going on based on which you could then build a governance structure. Mm. Mm. Belinda, yeah. would you want to give it a start? Oh, sure, do it now. All right. Um, Vina, thanks for a great question um, because we haven't raised it. So thank you. Um, so data is another missing aspect in terms of Claudia's previous question. Um, and again, you know, the challenge of building a policy and a strategy from the bottom up and across scales comes to mind with the data gathering. So X, you know, this is why it's such a brilliant question. Um, one of the things that's come through in the Limpopo work that we've been doing for developing a groundwater strategy is the necessity and other projects. Claudia, I'm also thinking of the Table Mountain um, aquifer, mm. you know, work. Um, the need for citizen science, as it's been become fondly known, we always manage to develop some more other terminology for things. But basically, it's about people, and I think it's your. You used the phrase, didn't you, of self self assessment, self self governance, um, self data collection. The biggest innovation in Africa in my lifetime <laughs> has been this thing. Um, Who ever thought that everybody would have one? But everybody does. And so let's make use of it. Um, so digitization for, I mean, real-time data on your phone. You're at your borehole. You're getting out some water out your well. It's got no water in. You put it on the system. Um, so that, I think, would be the... The innovation, the idea is there, so it's not my idea or anybody else here probably. The innovation again would be putting it to use um, in, a, in a meaningful way, yeah. Thank you. The second hand was over here. I'm not sure that the mic is working. We can hear you. Can, can you hear you? Yeah, we hear you. So, uh, I'm a no, use your mic. Uh, I'm Apurva Oza from the Aga Khan Foundation. And uh, so, uh, my question is that considering the drought we've seen in Kenya and the water problems and um, uh, agriculture being affected, the low area under irrigation uh, in many parts of Africa, are there lessons from the you know large smallholder groundwater boom which we saw in India, which drove irrigation substantially in large parts of India? Mm, I without, uh, and Tushar Shah writes about it extensively, without um, without the downside which we've seen in India, which is over-exploitation, water quality issues, etc. Is, is there a way to, because what I've seen is, is, is two extremes, either, uh, you know, just don't do groundwater because, you know, all this will happen, which then is causing a lot of poverty and drought, mm. and the other is then just follow the, you know, the crazy India model, and then, then bear the consequences. So, is there a middle path which can be which can be found? Yeah, that's yours. Yeah, yeah. I would. 
I would be very happy to try to answer that, address it at least. Uh, so two things. Uh, one is that indeed uh, groundwater and the green revolution uh, has has changed India tremendously over the past, what is it, four decades or so? Um, it has lifted a lot of people out of poverty and out of food insecurity, etc. But um, some would say, and Novena has been one of those researchers showing that there might be, we might be approaching a peak groundwater in in some parts of India. So indeed, there is a huge issue uh, looming or already um, seen there, and we do not want that. So one of the solutions, and quite disruptive, you could say, that uh, has been established uh, in some parts of India, also in China, I know, is to, to decouple the electricity subsidies um, from uh, groundwater being pumped for irrigation. So by uh, ensuring that the tariff system is set up such that you are not subsidized for the groundwater you're pumping for irrigation, whereas the subsidies would still be there for, for household uses and so on. So, so to decouple those things, and that has also worked fairly well in China as far as I know. Now, there's another disruptive change uh, in large parts of Africa, which for instance, the World Bank is, is promoting, and that is solar power. Uh, groundwater pumping and indeed uh, amazing fossil free etc ways of ensuring that we have food security uh, poverty alleviation and all of this but yes we see the problems there as well with over abstraction and how can we control that when we can't use this instrument of going via the tariff system and etc etc um, monitoring Monitoring of all those wells. In India alone, 22 million tube wells. In the statistics, we don't know about the rest that are not for irrigation. And in Africa, I don't even know. Other, other figures. As, as you said, how, so many stakeholders, so many end users. How do we... Uh, we need to reach each and every of them. And we need to raise the awareness and, and knowledge and understanding of the water cycle and climate change, um, how that we can't even predict. Uh, I mean, today we can't predict and the climate change uh, is already affecting us. Mm -hmm. Tremendous challenges, but um, yeah. Okay. Um, I am seeing you, but I also my colleague has just notified me that we've got two online people. So we'll take one online question and then we're gonna go over to you and then back on to the second online person. Thank you. Hilary? Um, so, Emmanuel Shile from, apologies if I'm saying your wrong name wrong, um, is asking if there are any legal frameworks under the static GMI that governs transboundary uh, groundwater in terms of usage and pollution prevention. Oh, this is between Belinda and Michael. Mm -hmm. You can, you can, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you can start. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I think to be honest, there is none in terms of groundwater that um, there are no transboundary legal frameworks that are used to manage pollution within this. And like I indicated earlier, that's, way, that's one of the greatest um, loopholes that we have there. Um, and I'm not sure how we will address it in the short term, because they, 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 on the other hand, you know, I think in addition to the legal uh, loopholes that are there, we also have the split mandates that are making our uh, uh, problems even bigger. So you would find that mining has given a mining license, lens has given the, 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 the <laughs> land rights, and then water we come in at the very last. So I think, yeah, the, but there is that gap. I think just to add to that, um, on, a, on a more positive level, how do we do it? Um, so, Mike, what comes to mind is the recent revision we did of the Okavango River, River, River Basin Treaty. I told you it was early in the morning. Um, and that, um, so the Okacom Treaty was signed in 1994, so a long time ago. Pre-climate change, pre-sustainable development, pre—you know anything, pre-water crises, um, and we've, um, with Ocacom, been working on a revision of that treaty over the last few years. And Mike, it does provide for contamination, pollution, um, etc. It's explicit about that. It also is explicit about 
ground and surface water. So, you know, I think that those treaties um, are the mechanism because the other avenue is the swear word, which is harmonization of, of laws and regulations across countries. So we've done exercises like, are the laws harmonized? Where are the gaps? We did it in the Zambezi Basin, which is eight countries. It was a mammoth exercise, over 450 legislations, policies, and regulations across those countries. Were they harmonized? No. Did they all have to be harmonized? No. Um, are there ones that are absolutely critical to harmonize? Yes. Is the region willing to go down that road? No. So, you know, the, uh, to me, the overarching treaty which the countries negotiate and agree to is probably the starting point. And then to mainstream that into national and subnational legislations. Thanks. And if I can add just quickly, um, those countries could also refer or rights holders could already today refer to that everyone are entitled to safe uh, drinking water uh, and sanitation and entitled to a healthy environment so through that right can we actually also uh, start addressing pollution contamination um, upstream downstream in the whole of the environment hmm. thank you very much for that for both those more legal overviews. I did not know that in the legal terms, harmonization was a swear word, so I learned something. Well, it's, not in, it's not in legal terms, it's in what people are willing to do. Mm. Okay, yeah. fair enough. <laughs> um, over to like you, please. Claudia. Uh. Oh, Kevin, I'm sorry. Um, we, we are first having an online, uh, an on-site qu um, question, and then we are going to go back to you. Oh, Sifu, is this you? Yeah. Yes. Apologies, yes. Sifu. Sorry, just hold on for a moment. We would like to hear from Sifu. Yes, so, sorry, I was cut off uh, my connection. And then uh, a question was raised about, you know, knowledge, information uh, around groundwater. And uh, I wanted to intervene, uh, reflect on that quickly. Uh, over, I would say over the last uh, decade, uh, there has been investment on knowledge generation around groundwater and among the hydrogeology community uh, people working and gathering information from the field and putting that into maps etc the reflections we have is that there is so much information in the hydrogeologist's hand nevertheless this has not been widely used by the users so knowledge around groundwater has been substantially improving thanks to uh, innovations, thanks to uh, you know skills, growing skills, uh, etc. But the way this information is being shared, maybe in some countries we don't have centralized data sets, uh, databases, mm. uh, but the situation allows that people to people data sharing happens. So peer-to-peer -peer data uh, exchange, information exchange, even skill exchange uh, happens at people-to-people -people level in most of Sub-Saharan Africa region. And then uh, if you recognize this and build, facilitate, uh, create platforms for exchange of information through uh, creating societies, associations, uh, civil societies around uh, uh, groundwater that would uh, bring uh, the needed uh, data information on the table of the decision taker. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you. I think it's a very important point. And also just to do that simple, well, that's not at all simple. It's the translation of geohydrological terminology into a terminology that can be understood and used and um, then acted upon by somebody that's not a technical expert. That in itself is 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 a major, a major um, um, difficult step to do. Mm. Um, okay, I'm finally going to go over to our on, on site uh, question, and then I believe there's another one online. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Sanjeev Chadha. Uh, firstly, thanks. I appreciate your sharing the multiple issues and challenges related to groundwater management <coughs> in Africa. I have two questions. Uh, firstly, what would you define as the single biggest problem we need to solve? as related to African groundwater. And my second question is, where is the best job being done 
you know, which is the best practice or role model that we can all learn from uh, related to groundwater management, especially transboundary. Is that a question for everyone? Okay. Um, yeah. Is anyone willing to put their hand up? Um, Sifa, I can't see you. I see Belinda's hand up. Mm. I can add. Uh, Go ahead. Um, mm. uh, yeah, I think the biggest... Uh, I love that question. It's mm. my favorite kind of question. Uh, the biggest thing to solve is knowledge. And knowledge encompasses data, awareness, you know, all of, the, all of those aspects. But I think that's the biggest issue. Um, on best practice, um, I wouldn't say we've got any shining lights, but um, one of the, um, there are a couple of transboundary aquifer pieces, but I'm actually going to talk about a, a national piece, um, which is Zambia. Um, and I'm picking on the national because of Sifu's point that it starts at home. <laughs> it starts at the local level. But Zambia has, with UNEP support, is busy developing aquifer mapping technologies. Um, so it's about generating the knowledge um, to um, test in a, and develop a state-of-the-art methodology for the assessment. So it's also about dealing with, you know, best practice assessments. Um, using that uh, method to go and map um, technologies against problems and challenges in a particular aquifer system, identify the solutions, so the technologies and other solutions that are needed, develop a groundwater management plan, um, and then upscale that, including two transboundary aquifers. And Mike, when you comment, I'm interested in your thoughts on where does one start? Where, does it start at an aquifer level transboundary, or do you start at a a subnational level. Just interested. Thank you. I think, Belinda, you have said it all, um, but it does start at subnational level. I think for me that that would have more impact as well. I think the biggest problem that we have in Africa would still be around knowledge. We don't know enough. You never know whether you are pumping a lot, too little whether you are polluting or not, and the complexity around, and I think the, the earlier question, has our technology not improved such that we don't need, I mean, in our basin for you to do a groundwater assessment, you at times have to drill three boreholes in a space of 200 meters, and each borehole being 250 meters deep. And those three will give you different results. Isn't, and that's an expensive exercise. Isn't there better ways that we could do that because it's becoming um, uh, prohibitively uh, expensive? The best, uh, I think Belinda answered it. I'm not yet aware <laughs> of a good one. Okay. Okay, uh, we have a little interlude, please. Uh, may we please welcome uh, Pevra Ramoeli. Thank you very much. And Thanks. thank you for, for racing here from the airport. Uh, no, yeah, this is yeah. not an easy feat. Um, neither will it be easy for you to jump in uh, exactly. mid-session discussion, mm. but we want to welcome you anyway. And thank you for being here. And I thought people could just see what I really look like. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Yes, uh, Kalinda, in the meantime, if I follow up on the on this question and uh, reflect on on it, on the questions that has been raised on channel two, oh. the single biggest problem, uh, and then the next one on best practice. Okay, uh, Sifu, go ahead. Yes, so the single uh, biggest problem when you come to the local level, there is no single. Uh, biggest problem. So we have multiple problems and then it's context specific. So when you add these together, maybe you can distill one at regional or at, at, at other scales. But at local scales, that must be. The, the, maybe the, 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 the biggest problem is identifying the problem itself locally and then addressing that problem. So uh, it's difficult to say that in, in the local context. But considering the various solutions proposed out there, for, for instance, in the accelerators to SDGs, innovations, 
data and information, partnership, financing, all sorts of, you know, the five pillars that has been recognized as key transformers and accelerators. It works also in the ground data sector. Nevertheless, innovation is growing, knowledge is growing, but the missing link for my understanding at the local level is the mid-level leadership, the capacity of the mid-level leadership to take this different, you know, different initiatives, different priorities, different um, information, and then take or facilitate local leadership and then local actions. So the capacity of the mid-level uh, water uh, sector professional is uh, the biggest uh, pr problem in my understanding. And best practice, I would say uh, from literature for transboundary context is uh, the problem shared approach for transboundary water groundwater governance. And then US, Canada, maybe a, a good example. Several aquifers are shared between US and Canada and each of the arrangements uh, are different. They are not exactly, you know, replica of one that, to, to the other. So they are set in a such a way that they solve the local problems. So uh, countries or regions that have employed uh, the problem shared approach in transboundary groundwater governance could be a best uh, example to learn from, uh, from. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, we are starting to run out of time, so I am, I am so sorry. I'm going to have to ask you to speak to the speakers afterwards um, directly. I've got one more person online that has been waiting, Kevin. Um, Hilary, would you please be so kind to uh, read Kevin's question? I will ask for a short, crisp response, and then we need to wrap up. Thank you. Okay. Um, there might actually be time for a one on-site question because Kevin's... Um, message is actually some, more of a comment. So this is Kevin Peterson from the Static GMI. Mm -hmm. um, he notes that Static GMI has advanced in transboundary aquifer assessments and joint strategic planning, uh, strategic action planning, excuse me. Um, the gap remains at local scale implementation. Um, he also left a comment saying um, the revised protocol on water courses deals with groundwater as a common terminus. So where it intersects with surface water, but exclude solitary aquifers. So I don't know if there's a response to that or if it's just something to note. No, I Thanks. think that is a very nice notification. I think it adds to, yeah. to the kind of uh, rounding of the answers. Um, we have got we have got eight minutes left. I am so sorry, I'm still going to keep it at this. Um, can I ask for some concluding marks uh, from each of you briefly? So please keep it crisp and maybe in rounding this off, what would you say is the key action point or enabling factor for implementing strategies um, going forward? So I'm going to start, well, between Belinda and, and Pera, you guys can figure out who's going to make that closing statement. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I didn't start, maybe I only would. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. Um, uh, well, look, I, I've just arrived late, so, uh, I probably missed a lot of what was said previously, but only maybe from perspective of knowledge of what's happening in the sub-region where I come from. We, we, I can only confirm that indeed at the regional level, a lot of work has been done. I mean, our groundwater management program is as old as starting in 1998 when the RSAP was developed and it became a, a distinct part of that. And the, re the reason was that Already at that time, we realized the importance of groundwater within the equation of the water balance, that the surface in the groundwater and the knowledge that is required to be known uh, of that resource has always been a challenge for us. And therefore, I think what needs to be done now is to dovetail this and move it down to actual implementation on the ground, as colleagues have said. We have had a lot of work identifying the shared aquifers within the region, and those there's some work that is being done through SADAC GMI. I know that they are doing some work in the in the in the in the various aquifers which are shared uh, as 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 work of trying to check and get more information because information is key. We have a groundwater information portal for the region, 
but that still needs to be developed in a way that becomes accessible, it, it gives the right information, and can get the data that is required to get there. So I think for us, we need to get, to get more work in terms of getting the data there. Thank you. Um, may I ask you, Michael, okay. for a concluding <coughs> statement? Um, I think for me, in conclusion, we need to go back to an exercise that we did a number of years ago mm. on integrated water resource management, mm -hmm. planning together. Mm -hmm. We will never solve our groundwater problems unless we go back to those basics mm -hmm. of IWRM. The, the current situation on the ground is it shows that we are working separately. There is mining, agriculture, and all doing their uh, damage to the groundwater or positive impact to the groundwater. But until we sit down and plan together, coordinate our activities, we would always have a situation where we see that there is deteriorating groundwater um, quality within the basin. We have just at Orasocom concluded the Joint Basin Water Survey on the status of water quality, and groundwater shows that it is indeed uh, deteriorating. So we need to go back to those uh, IWRM, talk to sanitation. In South Africa, I think one of our biggest problems is wastewater treatment plants and how they then ultimately, they would, the surface water one is easy to pick up. Everybody will tell you, no, the water today is smelling badly, but is the groundwater one that, mm. that we are not picking up and we don't even know the extent of that problem. So I think if we go back and start planning together, then our chances of us winning are higher. Thank, Thank you. you, Michael, that's a great statement. Um, Sifu, uh, last statement from you. We have got four minutes in the session left. Can you keep it to one minute? Jenny, one minute, and then I need to wrap up. <laughs> yeah, I think I've spoken too much and I don't have uh, anything to add. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I also think uh, so many wise things have been said. Uh, we also know the problem, uh, problems are just getting larger with climate change and this uncertainty, unpredictability, etc. Yes, we need more integration. We need... Uh, to break down silos, we need to be aware of all scales at the same time. Um, we need the knowledge from various different scales and um, other examples to just infuse others and, and learn from those. And uh, be open to, um, to learn you and uh, maybe um, uh, let go of uh, old practices that are not uh, useful anymore. Yeah. So thank you very much to all of our speakers. I think we have now reached the end of the session and thank you for flexibly flowing with us through the session uh, with, with speakers and, and co-speakers and uh, <laughs> everything else. Um, thank you to a lovely audience and thank you that the room has filled so nicely over the, over the, last, um, over the last hour. So this is great. I'm great everybody's found the venue. Um, and we've also had 16 people online, which is great to know as well. So all in all, there have been so many points. I cannot actually sum it up in a minute, um, but I think I would like to leave it with that last with that last point of Jenny. You're saying that you know it's important to actually um, start listening to each other again, and it's opening those spaces to to be able to listen, which is much more of an issue of psychology than it is a matter of politics mm -hmm. or anything else. So I think that does play into this quite importantly as well. Um, and with that, I would like to thank all of our speakers. Um, Belinda, Pera, um, Michael, um, Sifu, and Jenny for all your contributions. And I'd also like to thank um, uh, Hillary Jury's online as well as Stacey Warrington who have been holding the fort online uh, for us as well. And with that, I think I am now concluding the session. Thank you very much. Thank you.